Do you want to turn your pain into power? Then look no further than SleepyMonkeyTrainingAcademy.com. Go to SleepyMonkeyTrainingAcademy.com for meditation, mobility, and mace. Sleepy Monkey is a movement art that brings strength and balance to the body and mind. Located in Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. If you're in uh, New Jersey, you're in that portion of um, Pennsylvania, you're close enough that you could go visit. But start off by going to Sleepy Training Acad Sleepy Monkey Training Academy.com and check it out. Uh, there's shirts you could buy, and uh, you could send a message to Andrew over there, who is the owner, and you could, uh, you know, talk with him and see if. His fitness system is right for you. His fitness system is unique. He has a certain way of practicing. Like I said, there's meditation and uh, he, he handles people doing massages and things like that. But he also trains mace and other things like that. But you got to go to Sleepy Monkey Training Academy.com to get started. All right, guys. Enjoy the podcast. This is the Steel Mace Nation podcast. My name is Fred Moore, and today my guest is Tom Belinge of War Yoga. What's up, Tom? Hey, what's up, Fred? How you doing? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great, thank you. Great. Tom is an author, uh, martial arts instructor. You're yep. teaching Muay Thai in uh, yep. Fairfield, Connecticut, right? That's correct. Uh, okay, and uh, you're a native of the United Kingdom. You lived and trained yeah. all over Asia. Uh, yep. You now and you now reside here in the U.S. in, in yes. Connecticut. Yes, um, it's good to have you on the podcast, man. I um, I have oh, all here. three of your books. Oh wow! Thanks. Yeah. So here's the deal. I I uh, I bought all three of them, but I only read War Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's cool so that's, so cool. that's where you that's where most of your interest lies i imagine yes and i and i'm so just drawn to it uh it's so fun to read and it hits home on so many different things that i um that i i feel and i believe and um i have to uh, this is an order of business i have to take care of here yeah. there's a guy named andrew emsley he follows you He's at Sleepy Monkey Man on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, been to, I've talked to him recently. Right, uh, yeah. You did. All right. So I was yeah. just on the phone with him this morning. He was helping me prepare for this. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, he's okay, good, cool. man. He's yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. I had some, uh, I had uh, just a couple of kind of messages on uh, on Instagram. We follow each other. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, he's he's an interesting dude. Oh, yeah. He's deep, and uh, he's my go-to source for, like, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. And, okay, cool. Um, he told me, uh, talk about your chapter, War Yoga Worldview. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, so, I mean, let's get deep here, because this is what we like to do. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so, uh, first of all, War Yoga is um, a, a great book, because... I read it backwards. I read the the back end first because that, had, I'm sure some people will do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you know it's, it covers the Mugdar, the Gada, the Nal mm -hmm. uh, exercises. I learned something about the wrestler's pole. Oh my yeah. god! I never took that thing seriously. Yeah, the Malakam. But, yeah, it, but these guys training on this wrestler pole were the, the wrestlers, and they they when they applied their practice or when they fought each other or whatever, they were breaking bones. Yeah. It was submission wrestling essentially, or a, a kind of very extreme form of submission wrestling. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why it's kind of interesting because the Malakam now doesn't have, it's been kind of completely disconnected from that because essentially Indian wrestling now is like a freestyle wrestling. And then Malakam has kind of gone off into its own thing as like a kind of gymnastic discipline. That was a 19th century development. But really, they originally all stem from this kind of earlier form of wrestling where, yeah, you submission wrestling. Yeah. Somewhat like modern Nogi, except maybe not quite so um, sophisticated in terms of development, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I have total uh, different uh, view of people who, 
who do stuff on a pole now. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I, I mean, the Malakam is extremely difficult. Like, you know, you have to train from being pretty young to get really proficient on that thing. Yeah, I've tried. I'm. It's 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 very hard. It's very it's very hard. Okay, so there's no videos of you. Yeah, no, okay. no, right. thankfully not, because that would be pretty embarrassing. Uh, right. Yeah, they're really it's really difficult. Even just to hold yourself up on it with your legs is like, you know, pretty tough. Yeah, right. I mean, that's you're you're holding yourself up with your legs and you're extending your body out yep. perpendicular yeah, to the right. pole. Right, yeah. Yeah, all sorts of things are doing that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Talk about core strength. Oh yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah, and then the the front half of your book, you um are more metaphysical talking about, you know war yoga's worldview um yeah. you, you you everything comes out of a the hindu philosophies and the religion, yeah right? the, the vedic philosophy specifically the um the earliest forms of uh kind of uh you know from the, the rig veda and and so on um have some of the bhagavad gita in there too which is the kind of culmination of the four vedas um yeah i mean that's it's it's essentially uh and, and essentially kind of drives off on some of the stuff from the Upanishads, which is the uh, internalization of the sacrifice uh, that, you know, there was once this, I mean, it's still, it was still done occasionally, the, the animal sacrifice. And ultimately over time that got turned into a more of a metaphysical experience where you'd actually internalize, where it's all internalized and you kind of um, to use almost like a sort of Nordic thing is the kind of the idea of Odin on his tree. It's the sacrifice of the self to the self for the self, which is a kind of a, a out of context, a fairly strange and, and deep idea. But, you know, it's the ultimately at the heart of it, it's the sacrificing of the lower self of yourself, the lower part of you to the higher part of you. So you can kind of transcend and become a more than human being yeah and your uh chapter war yoga worldview sort of is the heart of that wouldn't you say i would say it's the heart of your book and it seems like it's yeah. the, it seems like it's at your heart right it's the it's it's essentially how the the what i would call, what i call the war yogin how the war yogin conducts himself in this world and how he sees himself in the world but not necessarily of the world and so he has to operate within it while being outside of it uh this is great stuff this is what me and i uh, just referred to andrew him and i have been talking about for a while and when we read this stuff we read it together this morning and i'm just like this blows me away this blows me oh, away wow. because this is um this is good stuff i i don't even Thank know what you. to say so how about you just kind of explain a little bit more war yoga worldview right well so essentially we're kind of um we're here on this earth and in this world but uh all around us everything is sort of becoming this kind of mechanized automated less than human experience where um we're not really allowed to well we're not able to most people are not able to fully express their absolute humanity and human nature uh and that ultimately you have to kind of reject much of what is of the modern world and modernity in order to be able to operate truly as you're meant to be able to operate and then through that essentially rejecting all the sort of systems that are put before you by uh you know whatever you want to say like you know authorities and so on and so forth um you have to kind of make yourself aloof from that i operate in the world but not be really attached to, to to what to what it's presenting to you and offering you uh, in order that you can then transcend. Yeah, it's so, sort of like a a monk type of philosophy, kind right? of. So so the it so it, the Indian term they have these these the sannyasi, which are the renunciants. So uh, often it's a, it's often seen as a stage of life uh, for very devout hindus which is that after you've had your uh time as a homestead or a household householder you then just renounce it all and go off into the world with no possessions to essentially wander and eventually die um <laughs> but th this podcast is brought to you by addictsclub.com
adxclub.com for adjustable steel mace and adjustable steel club. Have you seen these things? Have you checked them out? Go to adxclub.com and take a look at what they have. These are state-of-the-art mace technology at its finest made in the USA. Look at the Adex Arc. It's in between lengths of the clubs and the mace. So the, the club is the shortest, the arc is the next longest, and then the mace is the longest. But most people only train with either clubs or mace. How often do they go with an in-betweener? Technically, a arc is nothing more than a bulva, a short mace. Uh, but we don't call it that because we call it the arc. So go check it out. Check out everything there. And when you place your order, tell Don Fred sent you. Uh, so so often Indian wrestlers consider themselves to be similar to sannyasis, which are they've renounced much of that which is worldly. And so it works on the same principle, really, that the the warrior worldview ultimately is that yeah you've rena you renounce much of this materialism which is kind of put in front of you which ultimately is mostly just distraction from what's really important and the and the, you know the journey that you need to take sort of upward journey through the self to the peak of your being okay and if, are you rejecting everything also uh, as an appeasement to a god or it doesn't you can um you can, i mean i mean so there's different routes some people um i mean there's this idea of bhakti which is um devotion and so one of the paths people take is this bhakti towards a god or the or uh gods um usually towards a personal god but for me i like to because i consider one of the things about war yoga is this idea of that um, and it's echoed in a lot of traditional thought. It's not unique to war yoga, but it's framed in a specific way with war yoga, I guess, which is the inside insiders is this idea of Atman, the divine spark, the divine spirit, which is that it, within you is God, is a piece of, of the divine, however you want to say it. And that there's this thing called Brahman, which is the, the absolute, the total God, you know, total divine. And that inside you is this small part. So one of the things you can the idea is it's sort of a this metaphysical path where you can essentially refine down to the Atman, to the the spirit, that which is inside you, and that is what can transcend. And so, while um, through you, so to go back to the question of do you devote that essentially to a god, you can actually devote it to the god within, the god that is in you. So okay, that's, the, that's that that that's sort of this idea because we all have this spark of the divine. We have this this higher principle, higher order within ourselves. And so that renunciation, as far as I'm concerned, is a renunciation of that which is superfluous, this dross that needs to be burned off in order that um, I can, and I devote the actions of that, this sacrifice, this burning away of that which is unimportant to the spirit within, to the Atman, in, in Indic terms, the Atman. Yeah, I totally uh, am clicking with you on this because I was just recently going over some material from some Orthodox uh, Catholic uh, uh, monks. And, and they refer to um, the worldly stuff. And they call it worldly stuff or the passions uh, yeah. being distracted by wanting to feel good all the time and mm -hmm. uh, how it leads to degradation, right? Yeah, absolutely. So – uh, I think this has uh, been a struggle for m many humans uh, since time oh, yeah. began, right? Like yeah, trying absolutely. to, yeah, you have to deal with a lot of contradictions too. Yeah, for sure. So my question is, um, how does one, let's say I read, I read your book and I'm inspired and I want to move forward with um, a more disciplined, uh, like a warrior style um, mindset where I'm, you know, following the ideas in your book. But at the same time, I'm walking in a contradiction because I'm paying my taxes, I'm um, living uh, on my cell phones, putting videos up and things like sure, that. Yeah. 
And and of course, you know, going out for ice cream and pizza with my daughter, and then you know, I mean, I I live in Connecticut, so we got some good pizza. So I mean, I'm not going to renounce the pizza. Let's put it that way. All right, um, good. So so yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's finding that balance. So it's being kind of uh, fairly militant with your outlook on on things, but at the same time, like it, like it says in the book, you know, you, you do have to walk in this world. So if you look at it almost. Um, from a sort of uh, a Buddhist standpoint as well, it's about attachments as well. So it's when people identify with these pleasures and these things, whereas actually if you could kind of sort of get rid of a bit of, of the attachment from it and not be bound by it, like tied to it. So, you know, you can understand, okay, I really enjoy this pizza. This is, this is my thing. I want to go and eat, but like I'll eat that and enjoy it and it's great but i'm not going to be driven by that completely to the point where i'm just like oh, i'm just abandon myself completely to the pleasures of these things you know you maintain a sort of mental discipline in in some regards to how you see it you know that you understand that um this is a temporary fleeting pleasure it's not it, it you know and and that's fine and in regards to even just living in life like you have to pay your taxes you know you'll have to you know make your money and and live your life because you know otherwise you can't operate in the world and you have to be able to operate in the world to be able to actually renounce the world in that kind of cycle that oh, okay. that, that's a good point yeah how do you renounce something if you don't know anything about it right and i mean you know i mean ultimately it's a lot easier to um to renounce something when you are able to you know eat and have shelter and have these basic human needs covered because if you haven't got those basic human needs covered then it's a much more difficult task you know we haven't all got this luxury of like some of these ancient sages of just be able to kind of go and live in a cave in the jungle you know it's yeah. you know we have to live in this world but yeah at the same time we have to also understand that that in the material that not everything in this world is good for us uh, and that most of it actually is fairly harmful in many regards um, and is hindrance to your own personal journey, you know, and your refinement of yourself. So if you can kind of say, okay, I'll take part in this, but I'm not going to really identify as being of this. And I can then work on myself and my internal journey and kind of, that's the way I'd say, that's where, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, in the in this chapter we're referring to, you, uh, boy, I tell you, you made the hair stand on my back of my neck because um, it, it, I'm looking at the book. Um, you know, you talk about well, true freedom, really. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned bureaucratic bureaucratic systems of government um, and the state mandate, which is. Once I read that, I was like, "Okay, me and Tom, we we can <laughs> we can talk for hours, right. man. We right, can talk right. for hours." Yeah. This is a short chapter, and it is so on point, and it just delivers stripped down, perfect information anybody wants wants to know. And I read it, and it made me want to, like, you know, go out and start a rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to encourage open insurrection. Let's no. put it that way. But um, I hope I can start a rebellion within each person. You know, the the, the way they change their outlook on uh, the way the world operates and for whom it operates and right. why it does so. You know, and to make people question whether that is the correct way it should operate and whether they should participate in that or decide that they should reject that and do things their own way. Yeah. And you refer to the somatic system. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, you, you say somatic control. And um, I thought this was great because, uh, you, well, the somatic system is our, uh, our, our smell, our, our ability to smell, sound, uh, sight, and touch. And you're, you said something like um, the authority is um, – controlling that somatic yeah. system it's controlling what we're tasting what we're seeing what we're smelling and and it's it, is it is that giving ultimate control to them and is that why we're stuck in this uh 
sorrowful life of modernity that we that you um, i mean right i mean essentially that which you consume is spoon fed to you uh and so if you can i mean and and yes that is ultimately a form of control because you you have this idea of people have this idea of choices which are put before them and they have this idea of free choice but ultimately true free choice is to kind of reject pretty much everything that's being fed to you um but yeah i mean ultimately there is there are there are authorities which control what you take in your inputs so yeah and that's important that you pointed that out because we've all heard like well you know these people those people i picked up a weight sandbag from freedomstrength.us. Freedomstrength.us has sandbags of various kinds. You got to see what they have. There's a whole assortment. The kind I picked up is like ball. I, it's a 50 pound bag, um, which is heavy enough, believe it or not. I mean, if you're a really big, strong person, you know, he's got the bigger sizes. But for the way I like to train, um, you know, I like to swing my mace, and then after I get done swinging, I pick up the 50-pound sandbag, and I throw it around. But it's really great because I could throw it in my truck. If you have a car, you could throw it in your trunk, and uh, you could take it to the park with your mace and other stuff. And it actually acts as a seat or something to support yourself on when you're working out. Um, so you could do these, like, varied workouts, and you could really have a lot of fun. I'll put it on the ground and I'll actually lay on it. I'll put my upper back on it and I'll put myself into a bridge position. And then from there, I'll take a kettlebell or a heavy mace or something like that. And I'll, I'll just bench press it. And that's, and that's how it turns into a bench, but it's also a seat. Um, you could pick it up. You could do farmer's carries or you could throw it around and, that's what I'm doing with that sandbag. You guys can do whatever you want to do. Like I said, there's other things at freedomstrength.us that you can take a look at, such as uh, clothing and gear, weight vests, bands, all that stuff. So go to freedomstrength.us. My discount code for you is SMN10. That's Steel Mace Nation 10, SMN10. Get 10% off help support the podcast and help support an American company. Thanks a lot. Whoever they're in control. They're telling us what to think, what to read, what to eat, what to believe, but how, how are they doing it? What, what is the pathway? And so when you pointed out uh, the somatic system, how that personal that is, that's, that's mm -hmm. my, per that's my somatic system. That's my own nervous system. Right. Uh, stay off of that man leave me alone yeah. right 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 i mean yeah it, it's and it's a pretty it's a pretty difficult uh realization and and uh, obstacle to overcome ultimately yes. yes and i would think a lot of people would even reject that observation because it's so oh, yeah. difficult right a oh absolutely cognitive absolutely. dissonance mm -hmm. yeah definitely definitely it's not something that's easy to process ultimately yeah. so i mean but reading through your book it does help somebody on that journey um at least to just well, I, I hope so i hope so i, I hope think so, so. yes oh, I, yeah well yeah i think you got it so tom why is it that there's so many people uh walking around in this world who are you know not happy with modernity like, why is it so, why is it such a troubling thing for people, even though they seem to be like knee deep in it and living it, you know, enjoying modernity? They got smiles and stuff like that. But at the same mm -hmm. time, they seem like they're disturbed by it, perhaps, or I think it offers a disturbing uh, worldview and option. I mean, it's completely out of line with nature, ultimately, that uh, if you look at the idea of culture and nature, you know, culture has become completely out of sync with nature and human human beings have to be in line with nature you know and so um this idea of it, i mean i look at it in terms of, of a sort of culture and nature and we have a modern culture uh which has moved away from a traditional culture which 
essentially while it may seem less scientific or um you know it might seem even ludicrous from a modern point of view actually is more in line with human nature uh, and so the fact that modern culture has just moved so far away from human nature and nature in general because you can you can change culture but you can't change nature so you can you can change how you operate within a framework but you can't change the framework itself so modernity has just completely moved away and it doesn't operate smoothly within the natural framework the, the, the human nature so i think that's one of the main problems really is that we're so out of sync and that we've been put so far out of sync with the way that we're meant to be or the way we're meant to operate yeah and, yeah. and, and given this idea of pleasures and you know things that sh make you feel good but ultimately they're kind of fake because they only make you feel good for these short periods of time and then you're constantly thirsting for more of these pleasures whereas if you just stop seeking these pleasures almost entirely or the pleasures you do take you appreciate them for what they are and then have complete understanding that that is an escapist pleasure then you can operate a bit better but we've kind of got to this stage where we're kind of pushing people into constantly pursuing these pleasures or these uh sort of sense overloads you know right yeah and and that's the thing not only do you continue trying to pursue it but you want it even stronger yeah every uh, it's 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 not enough to do it like you did last time now you need no. two of them or you right. <laughs> Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the sort of golden chains that bind you. You know, the these sort of wonderful these these wonderful things, but these wonderful things ultimately are distractions and obstacles. You know, they're just if you can like just you have to just sort of re either outright reject things or just have full control over over what you, essentially having full control over what you consume and why and understanding from a personal level you know yeah. is a big deal you know that like so look having your pizza every now and again is like it's, that's fine you know like but you know uh going off and partying all the time and then you know we need to party more and more and more and i know that's more of a young people thing than older people thing but then again i mean i, I think if young people can understand that that's really helpful to them um but yeah, this is the sort of the idea of these sen sense sensory overloads and and always seeking pleasure and it never being enough ultimately. That you're always hungry for more or thirsty for more, whereas you know you need to step back from that and somehow just reject it, <clears throat> then understand it, and then operate in your own way through it. Do you have any ways that you can? go about doing that like do you uh, you've been doing this for a while you've been traveling you, you <clears> just <throat> got back from iran you've been to india yep. uh, all through mm -hmm. asia you, you're a martial artist uh you wrote these books so you must have a, a a way of talking to yourself i guess is uh like when you catch do you catch yourself in the middle of one of these moments where you're indulging too much and say hey tom you know what are you doing here uh is that yeah. how it works <laughs> like, is there well i mean i guess i mean so so it i mean ultimately i've built into a kind of fairly good routine no one's perfect we all you know have things you know that we did. i used to be a smoker when i was young i uh, smoked for like 16 years you know from age 14 to 30 you know and it, even now i can sometimes get a whiff of a cigarette in the air and think oh yeah that'd be great you know but i know that if i just went off and you know did whatever i wanted that ultimately it would hurt me more than it would help me so i mean it's kind of becoming built now in many ways um when i was young i definitely went down some of the wrong paths you know i think in some ways to get the realizations you have to have experienced some of the the dark times and the dark things you know so so you know when i was young i i definitely liked to have a good time you know um and like a lot and way too much and um i've i've had experiences from that which um completely messed me up to a point where i, it, I had to turn around and it was just like a completely willing turnaround of no this is not the way and so i mean i know some people who would say you have to go down this dark path to be able to come out of it which i don't think is necessarily true but um for me it definitely opened my eyes to things a lot more and had to make me re-examine 
uh, what I was doing uh, with my life, you know, and why am I doing this? And so um, I don't necessarily personally have like these moments where I have to go like, okay, Tom, I, mean, I have, I have talked to myself before about mm -hmm. this stuff, you know, like, don't, you don't want to do that. That's not a good idea. And, you know, it's not going to help. But like, ultimately, because in the past, I've been in a situation where I've been in situations where I have overindulged in, in almost catastrophic ways that I now know I don't even need to talk to myself because I already know that is a terrible idea or, you know. Okay. I got so, you. Yeah. yeah. There's a, you have to live life and get some experience and you got to know what too much yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, ultimately you get a measure of yourself, you know, you get, so you kind of figure out, okay, I can't do that. I can do this, but yeah, okay. ultimately that, but let's say somebody hasn't had too much of a bad ride or too much, too much overindulgence as a, as a youngster. Um, yeah, you can essentially talk to yourself in some, some ways. I've actually done it in a sense where uh, I have, um you know i so i still like to do some ritual things uh so even though i talk about internalizing the sacrifice i still uh in my own personal practice and life will do so sort of fire sacrifices uh which is uh you know i make i i various different things libations and so on but when i do these i often it i've done them at times um where i have I've noticed that I've been doing a certain behavior, which I know is not going to be good if I, if it continues. Right. Uh, and so I will do this. And then in that, with that sacrifice I make, I'll be like, I'll, I'll be like, it helps me reinforce like, no, you're going to not do that. And you're going to stop doing that because that's not going to help you. And just, you know, the sacrifice of the actual ritual itself of lighting the fire, offering something to the fire and kind of, sealing the promise to yourself with an actual physical act can also be helpful i've done that for sure yeah okay yeah so i mean everybody uh knows about like rituals that you do even like a basketball player has a, a ritual that they'll do before they shoot a free throw it just gets them in the right frame of mind exactly get it brings them back to their their calm core roots and right right it's like yeah. a refocus it's a focusing for sure like ritual has a purpose i mean in whichever way you want to sort of like talk about ritual as in like just individual like mental rituals that you might have to go through or physical rituals that you want to go through but those sort of rituals help you uh recenter take a step back reassess figure out you know what you need to do where you need to be get your mind right and then you can go forward again yeah and um, in your uh, in your book, you refer to the wrestler uh, throughout. Uh, you know, basically the and the philosophy that the wrestler has. Mm -hmm. And as I read it, I picture I'm the wrestler, even though yeah. I I don't wrestle. But yeah, no, right, right, that's correct. Yeah, so that's I mean, possible. just for somebody who doesn't do um, hand to hand fighting or anything like that, what is there another term that you would use for that? Would it be warrior? I say, well, yeah, I mean, I use, I increasingly use the word war yogin, uh, yeah. like a yogi, you know, like a war yogin. Um, I mean, warrior is fine as well. Um, I talk a lot about this idea of uh, not so just in war yoga, but in in on my on in other contexts in warrior in on my account and stuff like that on instagram or on my website so i did the, the kshatriya which is the warrior class um and it's just like um in the traditional caste system there is a war the warrior caste where the the ruling caste and so essentially it becomes the sort of the, the self-ruler the ruler over your own self uh, and so the warrior can kind of um not just stand for an actual fighter that goes out there and fights battles but also um the, the the internal fight the battle against the lower self and so you could definitely call yourself a warrior because you are always fighting uh against the lower part of your self your in your your unconscious uh and your basest animal instincts you know yeah, so, yeah warrior is a good term okay and and i i feel like um the mindset is the bigger of 
you know, the, the mindset and then the physical, the physical training and then the mindset training. I feel mm -hmm. like the mindset training is the bigger of the two only yeah. because uh, – a person can train physically. They can know how to kill. They can know how to fight. They can know how to train. But if they are uh, wild with their, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with their way of being and they're um, overly emotional and they they don't focus properly, what kind of warrior are they really? Right. Exactly. I mean, actually, in my latest book, which is not War Yoga, Age of Heroes, I actually um, examine that in terms of the Homeric uh the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, and there's a, an interesting part of that, which is this idea that um, the perfect warrior, perfect hero, I say the hero in, in that book, but the perfect hero is a, has a balance of both thought and action. You know, those things in, in perfect harmony make someone essentially an unstoppable hero. Um, but the tendency is, is that a young person is uh, stronger, physically more able, very capable, but their mind right. is not quite there yet. And then when you get older, your mind comes into the really good place and you have more wisdom and all that sort of thing. But then your body tends to not be in quite as good a condition. You're not as strong or fast as you could have been when you're younger. So you end up sort of having this time where one is over the other. But if you can kind of bring both of them into a good place, you can be both physically active and strong and mentally active and strong and then tie them together so that you have you take this physical activity and use it as a way of focusing your mind as well then you know then you're in a really great place yeah and i and i guess like um if you put an age to it it would be like a person in our 40s or something yeah. like that right that's where i am i'm in my 40s so. yeah me too that's why i chose yeah. that one <laughs> yeah i'm in the perfect frame right now but I'm right. starting to enter into the other one. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's almost like kind of trying to get that kind of timeless strength. You know, that's what I like about the traditional strength training, though, is that I feel like it's a lot less damaging to your body in, in many ways, as long as you don't go super, super heavy with things. Um, but, you know, it, it gives you more longevity in your strength practice. I feel. I agree. I mean, I, I'm someone who's beaten myself up for two decades, at least with uh with striking and now now doing jujitsu as well um kind of like i feel i feel quite broken in some regards so this is like it's really helpful to me to be able to get practice which actually helps me keep myself in in fairly decent physical condition yeah so uh as far as the types of training you do you're doing got a uh shenna board nal mm -hmm. uh yep. mugdar jory um you're saying that if you're a uh, an MMA practitioner, uh, that this type of training is is the best complement. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, the idea that you so look, I and mean, you can look at it almost like sort of powerlifting stuff. You know, for me, that in a way is more like the kind of almost like the old farm strength. You know, lifting up heavy things, carrying it over there. You know, which is the the strength that most people kind of needed some of those sort of you know lifting things up and putting them down big heavy things um but why train in that way when you can train in a way that a fighter trains that is a system that was designed specifically for a warrior class you know i mean the indian system of yeah it's called vyayam in india um of you know the gada the jari the different push-ups and squats and so on they're designed specifically for combat or they would they were designed with combat in mind you know uh, and the indian the iranian um um Zirkine, house of strength training it's for warriors it was designed to keep an army or a militia or just the general men in a position where they were in good condition that when a fight started or war started they could be straight in there and fighting you know, so so it's the perfect complement because it was designed in those systems specifically to complement combat, both combat sports and military combat. Yeah, and I, and you know, I would think back then, military, you know, you're still carrying heavy things too. Oh yeah, oh a hundred percent. These people are stronger in the past than they are now. We we are significantly weaker as human beings than people used to be.
how 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 do you quantify that? I believe you, but how do you yeah. actually quantify? Well, that? I mean, I mean, you just just think about like uh, my. I mean, from my position, my own ancestors, I know my grandfather, who was a Greek, he could pick a car engine up above his head and walk through the village with it and put it down. Okay. Like that's not that blows my mind. How could I even? I can't even conceive of picking a car engine up and putting it down. And then you look you look at all these things. If you go to India, there are now the stone lifting stones yeah no one can lift them now they're like 350 kilos oh really so it's like set you know some of these things are massive and it's just like yeah the guy okay. who founded the akara used to lift them and there's pictures there's like pictures of him lifting them up and you just yeah. think no one can do that now like what what is it like we have essentially if you kind of consider like this idea, so we have this very, very strong idea of, of evolution, you know, we're always improving, but like, that's not yeah. necessarily the case. And we're kind of involving, we're kind of going the other, we're going the other way, you know, right. like, like we've gone from being these extremely strong, you know, capable human beings to being much weaker. I mean, it doesn't mean we're not capable or we have the potential for cap capability, but like, when you hear the stories in the past and you hear about the weights that people were moving around and lifting, it's mind boggling. You know, that's, I mean, that's how I quantify it is just from, from those things, you know? Yeah. Those Greek statues where yep. guys are jacked and ripped. Right. Um, that's but they're not, not they're not like steroid Jack though. They're not like, you know, it's like a natural stacked. Yes. Kind of physique. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's real models they used. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's 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 some sense of idealization potentially in some regards, but yeah, that I mean that's what the athletes look like. You're not saying they use an uh, ancient form of Photoshop? <laughs> it, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> ancient. <laughs> right. Well, but yeah, I I mean, yeah. Then you got the Vikings where um, they found these lifting stones all uh, around mm -hmm. uh, other countries, so that means that they were bringing their lifting stone on the boat, invading wow. the other country, and then leaving it behind for whatever reason. Wow. But uh, wow. like 200-pound yeah. stones. Wow. Yeah. Right? Cool. So, Very I mean – I mean, I like stone people. lifting, but I'm an amateur at it. But that is cool. Yeah. That yeah. Cool. It's, it's – it's stone lifting is – I'm I'm not good at it. I don't do it. It's scary. I, 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 do, I do it. I do it. I'm just, I've got to work. I mean, my, I'm, it's one of my aims is to get much better at it and to get able to lift some of the, oh, I'd love to go and lift some of the historic stones for sure. It is just cool. visceral and dirty, right? Right. But I mean, it's, but I mean, you know, it's the most natural, heavy, heavy thing you can pick up, right? It's a big rock, pick up rock, put it down. I mean, <laughs> right. It's so simple. I mean, you know, it is. But then I, I also, through the stone lifting you can see the kind of mental aspect too that it requires this extreme focus and right. like it really can improve your mental game you know like it's easier than lift it's harder than lifting a barbell because you've got you've got to kind of find out how to hold this thing and learn about it learn how it wants to be kind of picked up almost it's like it's pretty cool yeah and then uh every stone has its own unique uh shape so lifting it oh, yeah. it's different uh, center of gravity and then also the terrain that you're lifting in you might be right. standing in the desert or you might be standing right. on some sod that once you lift the rock you start sinking into sinking it. sinking down into it right i've got that problem in my back I've, so i've got some stones in my backyard i like to practice on and lift and it's like a quagmire back there right now so I, it's really hard i can't really lift them right now because <laughs> that's just funny. so muddy yeah, it's yeah. funny that you bring that up because when I was checking out your Instagram, I I saw your your grass, which was non existent. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I right, said right, yeah. I said, did he is he chewing up his grass back there? Is that <laughs> him? Or is he just really bad at taking care of his lawn? <laughs> <laughs> so I have some grass that's nice. Uh um, okay. not right now in the winter, but like um the back is really shady. And I do, you know, not meaning as in it's sketchy, meaning it's like it's it's got a lot of trees. Uh, and um, yeah, I also do a lot back there, so it gets chewed up. And my dog also tears around like a maniac back there. So uh, okay, yeah, right. Your dog is yeah, yeah. that's gonna. Yeah. I, but I do have some nice grass. 
it's just okay. not, not as much of it as as some people would like in their their garden. You can't be a good American unless you have some good grass somewhere, right? I, I guess that is the uh, mark of whether you're a good American. And I actually, so I I got my citizenship um, this year, a few months ago. No, last oh. year, sorry, twenty twenty two. Thank you. Uh, yes. So yeah, I am now an American. So people always ask me, you know, are you English? And I'm like, no, I'm an American. It's not my my fun new game to play with them. Yeah, right. I just got a strange Brooklyn accent. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, about? yeah. Right. No, my, my, so my, um, the Travis, who's the gym owner of the, the martial arts gym that I, I train and work at, is, uh, he always tells people, oh, that's a fake accent. He comes from Jersey. <laughs> so, so he always tells everyone I'm from New Jersey, which is kind of funny. Uh, yeah. Well, New Jersey is, I, I make fun of my state. Um, New Jersey is sort of like another country in a way. Ah, yeah. Well, do you know, I mean, so we've, we've always got this funny thing cause we've got, uh, we've got a guy from Jersey who, who was training with us, but he's still part of our messenger group. And there's this ongoing pizza rivalry between oh, uh, yeah. the tri-state area, Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. And the one thing we can all agree on, Apart from the guy from Jersey, is that Connecticut's the best pizza? Ah, oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had you on my side over here. No, no, I'm a Connecticut pizza guy. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, but now have you have you checked out the Jersey Shore? That's where I'm located. Oh, are you? No, I mean you're not that far from me. I'm actually uh, so I'm on the southern, basically the southern coast of Connecticut, oh, right there, really close, yeah. yeah. Really yeah, close. you got to get down to the Jersey Shore if you if you do. Make sure yeah. you look me up and bring oh, yeah, some sure. bring some of your implements with you. Oh, I will. Uh, and I'll we can train will. on the beach. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah, that sounds cool. That yeah, there's good. there's been uh, like steel mace people coming from. Oh, there's a lot of steel mace people in our area, and right, and they you know they'll, they get on a chat group, and then it's like, hey, we're gonna meet at the beach. And then everybody oh, cool. comes. Yeah, you bring their maces and stuff. So yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd be fun to come down. I mean, I'm kind of lucky. I have I haven't seen her for a while because we're always busy in different times. It is Kelly Kelly Manzone? Yeah, Manzone. Uh, she's literally ten minutes down the road from me here in Connecticut. That's right. Yes. So I I mean I me and me and Kelly we've we've like hung out a lot. And have you guys worked together? Uh, we've talked about doing some projects together, uh, and then we never quite. Yet, but I mean, we both made our oh. jury at the same time because we used uh, Paul Wolkowinski's jury templates. And Paul's like a friend of both of ours, um, and so we we both got our juries at the same time, and sort of uh, from the same guy that we got it all organised from Pratier. No, so our juries are actually made here in Connecticut. Um, we had them made here. Um, I had, I found so big juries uh, require a certain kind of wood turner to make them. Uh, you need somebody who can basically do large furniture, or um, so you. So you've got different sizes of lathes, and most lathes can do an Indian club or something smaller. But like a big jury requires. A much bigger lathe and so it's what's actually called a mid-size turner it's not the it's not a large size turner a large scale turner will do like those wooden columns at the front of houses you know there's really huge ones yeah right so a mid-size will do you know a jury which is a good height i mean it comes up to my nipples and i'm like 510 um so they're pretty big um but yeah we had those made in connecticut by um by a turner i found he's an old guy and um, the thing is is that it's a dying industry uh, that people, young people don't, unless like suddenly a bunch of young, young hipsters decide we're going to really get into turning right now. And it becomes cool. Turning is definitely something that is dying out a bit because machine, you know, you can get computers to do stuff these days. But um, I found a guy and he's great. He's just really busy because there's not many turners and everything takes a long time for him to actually get around to doing so he's making juries as we speak. Well, he made it. We I gave him the patterns. Uh, I got the patterns from Paul Wolkowinski. Yeah. Uh, who's based in Australia. He's also a fellow Englishman, though, um, interestingly. Right. Uh, and so I gave the patterns to him and the Turner could produce them from the patterns. And can people order them? Like, is there, is this? I have, so I we discussed it. Kelly and I discussed this idea. But the problem is, is that the time frame that this Turner requires uh is long like he is extremely busy uh, and then he's somewhat seasonal in the fact that he has 
a couple of assistants that come in and help him, but they're also in college. So they are out for a lot of the year and then just come back in the holidays. And that's where he can really get some more stuff done. But um, he's, and he's really in demand because there's not many people doing large furniture and turning like that by hand. And so uh, okay. where we are, people, people want, we've got quite a lot of wealthy people on the coast of Connecticut and yeah. they want bespoke large furniture. So he'll be like, I've got to make a table that fits 28 people. And you're like, okay. So yeah, that's going to take that's gonna get precedence over yeah over my go. over over my my Indian clubs right yeah, right yeah yeah um but um I mean the thing is is anybody can buy the patterns from Paul Walkowinski so if you go to wow. his website um Indian Indian Clubs AU I believe it's called. Yeah, he uh, was just on the podcast a couple of ah, episodes ago. If oh, anybody's cool. l listening, you can refer back to that podcast uh, and listen to what he has to say. I think he mentioned that, but I don't remember now if he said if he. Yeah, said well, he I mean, he does. He sells. He has the patterns for both juries and meals, and they are uh, you can purchase them from his website. They are extremely reasonable. Um, and then all you need to do is take those patterns to a wood turner who can then make them. Um, yeah. And several people have done so. The juries, I'm not sure if many people have done them. Um, they are unwieldy. Yeah. And they're pretty difficult to swing. I mean, they are the pinnacle of, of club swinging in terms of difficulty. Yeah, I have one coming. I ordered a 15-pound one from Pratier in India. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So, but my goal is to get another one, but I, I want to get one from somebody else just so yeah. I could help support the community. I don't want to keep buying Yeah, right. Phone one guy so i'm gonna right. get another one after i figure out how to swing the, the oh one. cool yeah no pratchett pratchett is great um i've uh i've visited him in varanasi twice now um, okay i've swung quite a lot of things with him now did you travel with paul and kelly at all no and to that I've traveled with paul so the first time i went to varanasi i met paul we met up with paul there um and had a just I, I met Paul in in Varan. We went around the Akaras together. So the first time I went to India, it was with Paul, um, which is great. And then I went off on my own afterwards because I stayed for six. I, I every time I go, I don't feel there's any point in going for two weeks. So I always go for like six weeks. So oh. and Paul was only going to be there for like two weeks. So I ended up taking the next month on my own. And then the next time I went to India, I just went on my own for basically seven weeks. And oh then, man. Th that is fantastic. That's my kind of yeah. traveling right there. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And I would have liked to spend longer in Iran, but the the visa is only issued for like two weeks. So. Yeah, so, th they don't play around there, right? Uh, it's, they, you don't get as much leeway to. So what did you what did you learn from going to India, then going to Iran, as far as all this type of training is concerned, warrior mindset, the philosophy that you describe in your book, um, is is it all the same? Is there differences? It comes from the same root. I mean, I I believe it comes from a uh, Indo-European root. Uh, the Indo-European people are a sort of nomadic people that essentially ended up populating Iran, northern India, and Europe. Um few thousand years ago and so i believe there's a common root in that there's also with india and iran certainly a cross-pollination between those two systems so i think the both there was sort of the two systems in a prim more primitive form were both in place and then uh, actually it was during the mughal period which is when um the mughal empire was in india which was it was a islamic empire and so they'd come in, they were a Turkic people, actually. They came in and um, they started to import people from Persia, Iran, to come and do various different jobs in the empire. Uh, and then there was a kind of cross-pollination of those two systems because they were both wrestling cultures. They both already had a kind of physical culture involved swinging things, and these different push-ups and stuff. And I think there was also a cross-pollination there. Um, and so a lot of their, I mean, actually a lot of the Indian words they use for um in in the akara or some of the words are originally persian words so for example palavan is what they call or palawan is what the indians will call like a wrestler but that comes from the iranian word uh palawan which means hero or champion okay. so they, they, there's a lot of this kind of 
cross pollination there. And I've also heard, although I have to verify it, um, is that the meals that the Iranian swing uh, were first really introduced into the Iranian Zirkaneh, the House of Strength, after that period, after some Iranians went over to uh, India and saw the Jaris and brought them back. So, you know, who knows? But there's a lot. Of, I mean, I have to do more research on that specific point. Um, but there's there's definitely a cross pollination, but also they come from the original same root. Okay, and so I mean, everything is going to go all the way back to something or an original root. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. what? What? What was it? Like was it? I think just it's a caveman. I, no, but no. I mean, as far as I think, in terms of this stuff, is these these Indo Europeans who are um, essentially a nomadic warrior uh, people. Uh, who are herders they herded cattle um, they uh, raided each other they raided other cultures and so there's this sort of uh, nomadic warrior idea you know which they had with them and so that i think a lot of the uh, warrior training systems and the, the fighting arts ultimately come from this group of people who essentially lived for war lived for fighting you know that their their entire culture is i mean that's really interesting about the vedas if you read the vedas the vedas are all about herding cattle and and raiding each other's cattle and stealing each other's cattle and fighting each other which is essentially this indo-european group of people so the vedas are much older than india okay you know? uh, and the avesta which is the original iranian uh, material echoes that entirely too it's you can see the traces of cattle raiders and cattle herding cultures of these guys that are just warriors that used to live off cows steal each other's cows ride horses and chariots and yeah but i think i think that's where it comes from yeah i i would like to do some of that that sounds like a fun life <laughs> sounds fun right <laughs> yeah right drink, so, drink all... milk and raid cattle yeah and and um swing stuff right like we swing like to stuff. do right now so so all that physical fitness that they were doing the exercise they were it was geared toward their fighting so get towards war yeah it's good so towards war. anything throwing or swinging yeah right i mean so, if you look at the, the the iranians will literally you know you talk about this idea of the meals are like are like literally battle maces because this is this action the action you take to actually hit someone with i mean I've heard it talked about it being a sword and a shield, but ultimately right. the Iranians fought with what's called a gurs, which is a mace. And so it's like you literally, it's from a, a fighting mace. So you give them something heavier than your actual fighting mace and you train doing a lot of repetitions of that. And it means when you go to battle, you've literally got this action's muscle memory and it's, and the thing you're using is lighter. And so you can really, you know, translate directly into, yeah. into what you, you're doing, you know. Now, I always say that they tied a rock onto an end of a stick. Now, is that is that inaccurate? I mean, that's essentially what a mace originally is. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a rock on a stick. Yeah. <laughs> right. But how did they – like, what were they making them out of? Like, what, they were using a stick and then a, and finding a big rock? Because they didn't have cement back then. No, I mean, so the very first maces that we have in terms of historical record are, are you know, a, a sticks which have been kind of drilled out which means a lot of like time just isn't it, wearing this thing down to be able to put a stick in the end of it and hit and then obviously they become more innate and they have nice carving of the stone until it's this sort of lovely perfect decorative stone and then they make them out of start making them out of metal as soon as metals become available um, and yeah i mean it's, it's ultimately it's the first weapon right a stone on the end of a stick i mean a stone i guess is the first weapon and then after that yeah. you put the stone on the stick and then that's a better weapon so yeah i mean it's one of the earliest weapons used by people yeah the, the story i tell myself is that uh somebody picked up a stick or a bone whacked somebody <laughs> with it and then somebody a little smarter saw that and said well wait a minute i could take that stick or the bone and i could put like a hard rock on it Sure. Yeah, yeah, there, sure. there's your your arms race started right there. Well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> I mean, and this it, it doesn't get much simpler than a heavy thing on the end of a lever you can bash someone on the head with. Yeah. Right. You know. Now, when you train, 
um, your goal is to uh, connect the mind with the body. Is that your yes. specific reason for training? Uh, yeah, I want to have them into a, in alignment. Absolutely. I want and to basically have a, a, an absolute mind-body alignment because the, one of the things I'll notice is that my mind gives up before my body does. Right. So, so what are you doing? You're at that point, you're saying, okay, I, I got to go deeper. Yeah, you do. You have to dig deeper and mentally. And it's, it's always a mental game because the body is way more capable than people think. I mean, you know, when you pick something up and you get, you're like, okay, I know I can't do that. Or, yeah. um, you know, but often it is mind over matter, you know, to a point <laughs> when, when it is just like, no, there's matter is too heavy here. Um, but like you look at someone like um, Zach up in Canada, he's called Frank and Legs on Instagram. Yeah, um, he was just recently on. Well, so Zach, I mean, Zach's come and stayed at my house before a while a, a while back. But Zach's like, he will do those marathons, yeah, where he'll do twenty four hours of swinging something, which to yeah. me is pure madness. I mean, in a good way. I like I like insanity and in, in people that kind of insanity. Yeah, uh, that's fun. But but like. That is pure mind over matter because the mind, I mean, over a 24 hour period of swinging something continuously, your mind is what's going to be your battle. It's not going to be, yeah. you know, I mean, that that's what's going to do you. We talked about, he came on to talk about, he managed to, to last uh, 15 hours. He's done other things, 24 hours, but this particular one, he only mm -hmm. lasted 15, but he had like a shoulder problem. So I mean, right only on, 15 hours? Only, yeah, only. Yeah, right. Right. But right, it, right out of the gate, he had a, a rough start. His mind wasn't focused, but uh, what we ended up learning from his our discussion was the whole thing was like a metaphor for life. It was like, it, it was like he you could learn from the the trial he went through, and it right. makes the mind stronger. Right, it's a form of ascesis, like an asceticism. Like he's actually puts himself through or his rigor, this 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 hard thing, and it actually has taken him to another level in some regards to his his um, everyone to call it mindset or his right. spirit or how, where he's at. You know, I mean. Like doing something that's very difficult is a vehicle in order to to use a modern parlance to level up, but basically to kind of start to transcend to become more than yourself, you know, through a difficult act. Now, is this what you do when you start your workout? You say to yourself, all right, today's the day I'm going to transcend. <laughs> no, no, um, it is. So, tra I mean, for me, the idea of transcendence is a is a long process. I mean, I have to treat myself as always being unfinished in that regard. You know, I've got to always keep striving for perfection and not surrendering, not giving up, you know, just keep going. Uh, and hopefully that will come with it through the focus of my mind and trying to align it in with my physical activity. Um the idea that you know i mean so you've got these ideas of of like so if you look at look at the idea of the buddha there's this idea of this person who's transcended right the, this perfect transcended being you know he decided in his 30s he was going to do it and it took a lot of time but there's this moment where he just sat under a tree and did it and it happened you know that the conditions were right and he got to this thing and so he did this path of contemplation well I've tried contemplation and it doesn't suit me particularly well. You know, it doesn't mean you give up on it entirely, but like sitting down and meditating while it has benefits for me is very, is it's, it's meant to be difficult. Of course. But, yeah. um, it's not for me. Whereas I feel like through this path of action, as in this movement, essentially it's a movement meditation, right? That's where I can kind of feel like I can climb and ascend this mountain of, of transcendence, you know, and, hopefully one day i can reach the peak of that but like you know it's it's every time you do it you're trying to take steps to climb up that mountain you know and it's going to happen any minute for you oh, well i mean you never know i mean a you zen master would, a zen master would say it could happen just like as an instant transcendence yeah sure i mean it, yeah it could i mean the idea of transcendence it could just happen like you yeah. could have this realization boom okay got it but yeah. um, 
I don't go into it thinking, yeah, this is going to happen. I, mean, I just, I'll just like, I'll keep trying to climb that inner mountain, you know? Right. And just stay on the course. I, I like how you, you, you pointed out uh, contemplating or meditating doesn't really work for you because it doesn't work for me either. And uh, I've always been a big fan of moving meditation. I used to mountain bike a lot. Uh, I still do. But back in the old days when I mountain biked, I would literally have out of body experiences. Oh, I, yeah, I, I believe it. And, and, and ever since then, I was like, okay, this is a thing for me, you know? So, I mean, yep. um, that's fascinating that uh, it, you have these different ways of doing it. But, um, and when, well, you... I mean, the, the, the Japanese Buddhist monks would, I mean, I guess the Chinese Chan Buddhist, which is all Zen as well, would basically say that all things are meditation. You know, you chopping your vegetables for your dinner is a chance for you to, you know, med it's essentially a meditation that you oh, focus yeah. completely on what you're doing. You're living completely in that moment. You know, that there's nothing outside of that. You have to be completely in that activity. And that's what these exercises for me enable is to be fully present in exactly what you're doing right there. You can't be thinking too far over here or there or what am I going to do about dinner tonight? Oh, I've got this problem at work. You know, you've got their mind has got to reject all of that because, okay, it can do that for like a certain number of reps, but you want to keep going. You want to keep working at that thing. You're going to have to completely focus on that moment. I'm sure that's what you got from mountain biking. Cause you mess up with that. You're going to. Yeah. You're gone. You're wiped right. out. Of it. Yeah. And you got to, sometimes put yourself on the edge otherwise you just can't get there it's so you have right. to live a little bit of a dangerous life sometimes yeah yeah sure absolutely absolutely and, you know and, it's like sometimes lifting up like a now like the first time you have a heavy now and you've pulled it up to your shoulder and you've got it here and you're going to lift it above your head and you think man if i yeah. mess this up this will just smash this will just crash into my head you right know? you knock Simple yourself stuff. out I mean, yeah potentially and even when like, you wake up your things, wallet's yeah. gone god right and completely done you know so like yeah you, to do that you have to just really focus really get into that moment and just there's a have kind of an act of faith in yourself yeah that you're like i'm taking i'm taking a leap of faith in my own abilities and that edge like you're saying is like essentially that is that's the place where you can really see something or do so you know it's, it's that it's the way where you can cross a threshold into another place you know yeah that's beautiful so, uh so in in closing uh last question before we go uh we'll go sure. back to being deep again uh, well we were already deep but even deeper um oh, wow. uh you you speak of modernity um and how it's you know a problem and um you we we had these we 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 discussed all this right here and for me i'd like to bring the stuff into light to help people like especially people who are caught up in it but i also yeah. feel like uh we're losing our sense of a people we're 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 falling into weakness and it's yeah. it's scary and i and yeah. i fear for my child's future actually mm. so if with what you, all your books you have, your three books, and everything that you you do and and you talk about, uh, what can you say to people who are uh, realizing this themselves and looking for a way to start changing things and maybe help the world? Right. Well, if you want to help the world, you first have to help yourself, right? So the first thing you need to do is really focus on on yourself because if you're not in a position that's the you know i mean essentially if you're not in a position to be able to you know if you're not in a position to help the world how can you help the world first of all uh second of all the world doesn't necessarily want your help which is another problem <laughs> yeah. um, but ultimately you have to take a sort of selfish path in regard to not being in the negative context of selfish but just you have to um you have to look at look at yourself examine yourself examine your behaviors examine your interactions with the world examine how these things affect you and then try and cut out the things which are harmful or toxic if you want to put it that way uh to your own self and your own sense of self and being 
uh, and then try to um, uplift the things which are good for you. I mean, it, it ultimately it it's all comes down to you and your interaction with the world. You know, like like I was saying earlier, you can't change nature. So in the same time, you can't change the world, but you can change how you choose to operate within that world. Yeah. that's the only thing i mean it's almost a stoic concept of this idea of you know it's how you perceive it and you know it's you know how you react to the stimulus that's put in front of you but ultimately you have to just examine yourself examine the things you do see if they are beneficial to you or not and then ultimately take action and make choices on a personal level that will improve uh your experience of life I mean, I think that's that's the most important thing, really, right there. I like it. It's a simple message, and that's easy to take action on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if something, if you try and set yourself very complex sets of very convoluted goals, and you're going to fail because it's too much to think about. Whereas if you can give yourself simple, actionable things that you can just work on and act on in in the short term, and then into the midterm and long term, but like if you can just act, if there's something you can change right now and it will be a benefit, you do that and it's simple, right? You just do that one thing and then you maybe you feel more comfortable with that you can do another thing, another thing. You can build it up. I mean, ultimately, you can't change everything at the same time about the way you operate. It's not possible. No. I mean, I guess it is, but you're going to be miserable and you're probably not going to be very successful because you're going to revert back to the kind of, toxic behaviors which made you feel good in the short term whereas if you can slowly cut out things and add in other things over a period of time and understand that it's okay to not be perfect right now but to strive to try and find a form of perfection over a period of time yeah then you know that's a good thing you know and also to understand you know at the same time you can't wait forever either to take action because we're all going to die right we're we've got a finite amount of time on this planet and so you've got to make the most of it like what's beyond that and what's whatever you know different people have different opinions on that but the one thing that you're guaranteed is you're guaranteed a period of time right now and so you just do what you can do now in short steps don't delay don't procrastinate what do you need to do do that do that do that slowly slowly step by step and soon enough, you'll find yourself in a much better place as a human being. And your relationship with the modern world will be a much healthier one from a personal perspective. Yeah. For more of that, people can uh, grab the War Yoga book. Uh, yep. Tom explains more of this. Uh, yeah, I mean, he talks about taking action and things like that. So uh, go to TomBillinge.com. Uh, Tom Billinge, right? Tom Billinger, yeah, Tom Billinger. Okay, it's Tom a very Billinger. unusual name. Um, we're yeah, not. It's like too... We're not a common group of people. There's not many Billingers. Okay, all right, that's not good. Many. You're you're unique. I'm a unique and beautiful snowflake. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, TomBillinger.com, or I also have WarYoga.com, and um, I have the Instagram handle of WarYoga. Yeah, uh, word, which is uh, uh, where I put the majority of what I'm putting out there these days yeah that's and uh check the show notes everybody uh you'll see the links down below so uh tom thank you for Fred, thank you it's been great it's been fun yeah it was great and uh i would love to have you come back on after i read your other books yeah please that'd be great I'd okay cool all right well we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future great thanks Fred. all right thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you at the next episode